Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another mystery where today I want to share the story of a case that I'm sure a lot of you have already heard of. I do tend to steer clear of the more well-known cases on my channel simply because I would prefer to give this platform to the cases that perhaps need more of a voice but after the Southerton man has recently been identified, something which as I'm writing this or speaking this still hasn't been confirmed by the authorities but is looking very positive I've decided to share another story that genetic genealogy and maybe one last big boost in publicity very much could find the answer for, and that's the case of the boy in the box. This case refers to an unidentified murder victim in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, found on February 25th, 1957, the body of a young boy. Despite being a very highly publicised case with so many leads over the past 65 years, no one has ever come forward with his name or his killer, but I truly do believe that we will be able to find his identity sooner rather than later, and alongside that we'll probably find the identity of his killer as well. Will we be able to get true justice 65 years on? It is unlikely, but we can get something. According to an official police spokesman for this, this case does officially remain open. But before we get on with the video, I just want to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring us today, the documentary streaming service. I'm sure over the years you've all already heard why I love Magellan TV so much, so instead of listing all of the endless reasons, I'm just going to tell you about something that I watched recently on there called Death Row. Now this is actually a six episode HD series about, you guessed it, the death penalty, specifically in the United States. The series explores every aspect of the punishment, how it's changed throughout history, how it stands presently, how it's likely to change in the future, and who has met their end thanks to it. I just found it an absolutely fascinating deep dive into something which I ponder on a lot on this channel. We've had so many discussions here over the ethics surrounding the death penalty. It is an incredibly controversial topic with so many important facets to think about. But my favourite episode in this series is actually episode 6, which is the last one, which looks into the last meals and last words of the people on death row. Did you know that last meals actually started as a sign of forgiveness towards the person facing death before they left the world? It just was so fascinating, I feel like I learnt so much, I really, really do recommend this one. If you want to try out Magellan TV for yourself and watch Death Row, then you can click on the link in the description box to claim your one month free trial. They have more true crime and history documentaries than you could possibly dream of. I actually want to start out today by giving a shout out to one of my main sources for this episode, and that's the book Boy in the Box, The Unsolved Case of America's Unknown Child by David Stout. This is the most comprehensive account of this case beginning to almost end, as well as just being a really good read. It's only £1.99 on the Kindle store, so I will leave a link down below in case anyone fancies reading it for themselves. And you'll also find all of my other links to all of my other sources down below as well. Luckily for us, this is a very extensively covered case even today, so I wasn't exactly fighting for sources to pull from for this episode. Although the majority of sources will refer to this as the boy in the box case, you might have also heard of this story as America's Unknown Child or the Fox Chase Boy as well. So our story begins in early 1957 in northeast Philadelphia in what is called the Fox Chase section of the city. It was named three centuries beforehand because it was a popular area for, you guessed it, fox hunting and the name just kind of stuck around. We're focusing specifically on Susquehanna Road, a road half a mile in length linking Pine Road in the west and Berry Road in the east. At this time, the southern side of Susquehanna Road was wooded, with trees extending back several yards from the road before just opening up into open fields and scrub. Back in 1957, it was still a great place for hunting, and it wasn't really much of a residential area back then, although Google Maps tells me it is now. The only building that really stood on this road at the time was a school for wayward girls run by the Sisters of the Good Shepherd and it was almost directly opposite this school in the wooded area that the boy in the box would be discovered. It was the 25th of February when police were first notified of this discovery by a young man who'd been hunting muskrats in this area. He told them of a cardboard box in the woods of Susquehanna Road across from the girls' home. This man had been in the area checking his traps the day before, on Monday the 25th of February, when he first came across this box. And this wasn't unusual in itself, this area was often used by people as a dumping ground for all of their junk, but something about this cardboard box made him stop in his tracks. 
He approached it and looked inside, seeing a doll, but something about it didn't seem quite right. The hunter didn't want to contact the police straight away, he had recently been accused of hanging around on this road just to peep at the girls in the school, he didn't want to go back to the police and admit that he was in this area again. But the next day, after a long and sleepless night, he did make the report. A patrolman called Elmer Palmer was the one tasked with the job of finding out what was in this box. They knew it was either going to be the body of a child or a very realistic doll. He soon found the box in question, which was labelled Fragile Handle with Care, and inside the box, of course, was the body of a young boy, arms carefully folded across his stomach and wrapped in a small blanket being cut into two pieces. The blanket had a very distinctive diamond plaid design in green, rust, brown and white. On first impressions, the boy looked to be malnourished, he had his eyes sunken in and his hair was crudely cut close to his head. The look on his face was described as frozen in a position as if he were about to start crying, but he never got a chance to, his life just coming to an end. Once the crime scene was secured and everything had been noted, the boy's body was taken to the local city morgue to be looked at by the medical examiner, Dr Spellman. The body was obviously a very sad sight, it was clear from very early on in this investigation that this was not a boy who had been loved or cared for very much, particularly in the weeks leading up to his death. He was just over 40 inches tall, so that's about 3 foot 3, and weighed only 30 pounds, which is an incredibly low weight for his height. An information leaflet from the time suggests that the boy was aged between 4 to 5 years old, however more modern sources tend to suggest that he was anywhere from 3 to 6 years old. The malnourishment of his body suggests that his growth might have been stunted, so he may well have been older but still had the body of a much younger boy. He had blue eyes and a fair complexion, he was Caucasian, with medium light brown hair that had been cut, like I said, crudely cut close to the head. He had a full set of baby teeth, and a quick Google here tells me that a child's baby teeth typically begin to fall out around the age of six, so he was very much likely younger than six. He had an L-shaped scar under his chin, as well as several other small scars all over his body, including two small scars in his groin and left ankle that might have been the result of a medical procedure, maybe small operations, but canvassing of local hospitals didn't provide any answers as to this. He had no vaccination scars, no signs of any previous dental work, he had been circumcised and his finger and toenails had all been neatly clipped, which was one of the only signs this boy had ever really been cared for. He had three small moles on the left side of his face, one tiny mole below his right ear, three small moles on the right side of his chest and a large mole on his right arm just above his wrist. His entire body was covered in bruises, particularly on his face and head, and some of them looked like imprints left by fingers. He also had wrinkled skin on his right hand and on the soles of both feet, as if he'd been submerged in water for an extended period of time, but this wasn't over his whole body. Is it possible that his carer, and I do use that word loosely, had cut the boy's hair, holding him tightly by the head to keep him still, before sticking him in the bath? That was kind of the theory the medical examiner worked under in those early days. It was clear that the boy had not been sexually abused at any point, which is one small silver lining I suppose, and he'd also never had any broken bones. He'd not eaten for two or three hours before his death, and it seemed that he had vomited shortly before he died, with this dark brown residue coating his esophagus. And then when Dr Spellman shone a UV light into the boy's eye, it reflected a bright yellow, suggesting that a special dye had been applied to his eye before death, which was indicative of a chronic eye disease that he might have been being treated for. So you've got this boy who's incredibly malnourished, he's clearly not very well looked after, he's got this very crudely cut hair, but he might have been getting treated for a chronic illness. If he had a carer who clearly didn't care very much for his well-being, how does being treated for a potential illness fit into this? Ultimately, the boy's death was noted as blunt force trauma, and it was originally estimated that he had died two to three days before he was found. However, this was February and it was cold. The weather may have slowed down decomposition, meaning he might have been out there even longer than that. It would eventually come out around mid-March, so a couple of weeks after he was found, that the muskrat hunter hadn't been the first person to come across the boy in the box. 
an 18 year old called John who lived on nearby Pine Road had also come across the box while he was also partaking in some muskrat hunting. He was checking his traps that he had hidden around this area. And he didn't check his traps all that much but he did that day coming across the body. He couldn't remember exactly when it was but it was likely the Saturday before the boy was found so four days before the police were called. Scared and shocked, 18 year old John didn't tell anyone what he'd found, scared of his parents telling him off as they didn't like him hunting. Investigators and the medical examiner assumed that identification would come fairly easily in this case. They thought they would take footprints and fingerprints and be able to match them to hospital records, or that somebody would soon come forward reporting their missing child and all the loose ends would be able to be neatly tied up. Only as we know, 65 years on, that never happened. As Bill Kelly, the head of the Philadelphia Police Identification Unit, said to the Philadelphia City paper back in 2015, at first we figured the boy's family would come forward, say his death was an accident and offer some sort of explanation, but that didn't happen. Days and weeks passed and still he wasn't identified. And the fact that he did remain unidentified lent to the fact that this would become the most heavily investigated case in Philadelphia history. Nobody was willing to rest until they had the answers, and still today people are working on this case, but with each passing year, legitimate leads get fewer and further between. But let's talk through each clue they had, how each lead investigator followed the clues in those early days. And we'll start with the box, which was in surprisingly good condition considering it had been out in the elements for at least two days, maybe for up to a week. The outside of the box was damp, but the inside was dry, so it definitely hadn't been there for too long. The shipping label on the box showed that it had been sent from a company in Peru, Indiana, to a JC Penney store in Upper Derby, Philadelphia, which is just 36 miles southwest of Susquehanna Road. It was found that the box had originally contained a bassinet, and it was found that the store had received a delivery of a dozen of these on the 27th of November 1956 and they sold them between December 3rd, 1956 to February 16th, 1957. So the last one was sold just a couple of weeks before the boy was found. However, the store did only accept cash at this time, so there were no records of who had actually made these purchases. They did eventually manage to track down 11 of the buyers, and it was confirmed that none of them had any connection to the boy, but the 12th buyer was never confirmed. Although, of course, this doesn't mean that the mysterious 12th buyer must be the guilty party here. They could have simply discarded of this box somewhere and the killer was able to pick it up. And the same goes, I suppose, for any of the other 11. They could have just put their box somewhere and the killer found it and used it for this purpose. It was a lead worth following for investigators, but it wasn't necessarily going to lead to the killer's doorstep, and they knew that. So then they focused in on the blanket the boy was wrapped in, which was cut in two with a square missing from the smaller section. Was this square potentially cut away because it had an identifiable label on it? The blanket, it turned out, had been recently washed and it was sent to the Philadelphia Textile Institute for further testing, where it was found that the blanket had been mended by somebody with poor quality cotton thread. It had been either manufactured in Swannanoa, North Carolina or Granby, Quebec. But this blanket was mass produced, there were hundreds of thousands of them made and tracking down the buyer of this particular blanket would be impossible, so again it was kind of another dead end. And so they turn to the next clue. A man's blue corduroy Ivy League style cap in size 7 and 1 8 was also found in a path 17 feet away from the box, with the label inside showing that it was bought at the Robins Bald Eagle Hat and Cap Company in South Philadelphia. The owner of the store actually remembered making this hat herself from leftover corduroy, saying she made 12 of them in total. In a stroke of luck, the owner actually remembered making this specific hat, as the buyer had requested a leather strap on it. She said the buyer was in his late 20s with blonde hair and was wearing work clothes, but she didn't remember a name. She did say she could see a resemblance between this man and the boy in the box, but despite a search, this man was never located. This of course could have been innocent, he could have been out on a walk and lost his cap, or it could have been more. As some investigators were following these leads throughout the city, others remained at the crime scene. 270 police academy recruits combed the area looking for anything that could be a clue, and they did find a number of things hidden in the underbrush. Shoes, scarves, clothing, but nothing was ever able to be definitively linked to the boy. 
As I mentioned previously, this site was often used as a dumping ground. There was a lot of rubbish there to sift through. They did find a man's handkerchief with initial G embroidered onto it, but they were never able to determine if this was connected to the case or not. The handkerchief was fairly clean and it hadn't been there very long, but there were short strands of hair on it, which was similar to the hair that would have recently been cut off the boy's head. They tested this, but the testing never proved anything. Some officers went into the local community to talk to people to see if anyone knew anything of a missing child, but again, they had no luck. Police even went to speak to children at the local playground to see if any of their friends had stopped turning up to play, something which I'm sure wouldn't be allowed now, but they did it back then. Word spread incredibly quickly about this dead boy and investigators thought that any day now somebody would come forward with their information, but they never did. And this suggested one of two things. Either the family the boy came from was incredibly reclusive and didn't leave the house, didn't get involved in the community, no one knew who they were, or the boy had come from much further afield. Soon, word of this case did quickly spread across the whole country, leaving Philadelphia. The case of the boy in the box is infamous, but if you were in Philadelphia, you definitely knew about it. The Philadelphia Inquirer printed 400,000 flyers with pictures of this boy, and a flyer was included with every single gas bill that went out in the city. Every single house had a flyer with the boy in the box's face on at some point. A slight warning to my YouTube viewers that I am about to share this flyer on screen and it does include post-mortem photos of the boy. I think it is helpful to share his face in this case. So look away for about 15 seconds. As well as this, the flyers were displayed in stores, post offices, anywhere where people would pass and see it. Also, all local hospitals, orphanages, care homes, doctor's offices were canvassed by the police to no avail. Dr. Spellman, the medical examiner, even arranged for a group to look through birth records at Philadelphia General Hospital from 1953 to 1955, when it was suspected the boy could have been born, and investigators released a post-mortem photo of the boy fully dressed and in a seated position, as he might have been in life to see if that would spark recognition in anyone. Again, I will be putting the photo here. If you don't want to see it, look away for about 15 seconds. Not long into the investigation, investigators received a call that they thought might lead to some answers. The woman on the other end of the line asked calmly if investigators were able to tell if the boy was weak-minded, asking if they knew what it was to take care of an idiot. She said, sometimes you get so sick of their crying that you can kill them in a fit of anger. That might be your explanation. Before anyone gets mad at the woman's choice of words here, it is important to remember that this was 1957, a world long before the more delicate terms we'd use today were coined. Of course, investigators didn't necessarily have a way to tell if the boy in the box did have an intellectual disability or not, although they did have something in the form of the dye in the eye to suggest that maybe he did have a form of physical illness. This call from the woman does certainly sound like she might have been confessing to something, possibly confessing to being the stressed out mother who couldn't deal with her son's needs anymore, so ended his life. Or she could have just been any stressed out mother. It certainly sounds like she was unsupported, dealing with a disabled child of her own and taking out her stresses on the police. She didn't leave her name or any further details and she never called investigators back. And this was 1957 and they weren't able to trace the call. In mid-March, the local police officially turned to the FBI for help, as more and more tips continued to pour in. They simply didn't have the manpower to be able to fully investigate all of this on their own, they needed help. Around this time, a man, known publicly only as the Good Samaritan, said that on the Sunday afternoon he was driving down Susquehanna Road, when he came across a woman and a young boy on the side of the road, standing next to the trunk of their car. He stopped and asked this woman if they needed help changing the tyre, to which the woman signalled no, so of course the Good Samaritan went on his way. Only after finding out about the boy in the box did he think of this situation again and called the police to let them know. He said that they did seem sketchy, like they were hiding something, hiding their faces and blocking the car's licence plate number with their legs. Could this woman and young boy have been disposing of the body together? Or was she just yet another person fly-tipping on the side of the road? Both illegal, one worse than the other. Over the coming months, multiple people would come forward claiming they knew the boy's identity, but nothing ever panned out. 
Some were even so sure they came to visit the boy in the morgue in an attempt to identify him, but of course, they never recognised him. Occasionally, though, investigators would get a call that was more helpful. One day, the Homicide Bureau got a call from a man called Max Schellinger, a barber who said that he was almost sure that he'd cut the boy's hair just a number of days before he was found. He said the boy had been accompanied by his older brother and that he'd told the barber that he had five brothers and a sister. They all lived in the Strawberry Mansion neighbourhood. The barber was so convincing with his story that investigators took him to the morgue where he identified the body with certainty. He had definitely cut the boy's hair, only he didn't know his name. So the Strawberry Mansion neighbourhood in North Philadelphia was searched door to door. And this was very much an area of economic decline and urban decay. The Strawberry Mansion neighbourhood, whilst the name sounds lovely, wasn't exactly a nice area to live in and still today has a reputation of being one of the most dangerous areas in the city. Despite investigators speaking to every household, no one knew of a family with a missing child or even a family with a description the boy had given, six boys and one girl. To this day, we don't know if the barber was mistaken or not, if he ever really did give a haircut to the boy in the box. Seeing as the boy's hair was cut so crudely, so badly, it doesn't make sense this would have been done by a professional barber, but maybe his killer, whoever it was, cut his hair again after or just before his death in an attempt to hide his identity. That's certainly not out of the question. The boy wasn't buried until July 24th, after a huge number of viewings of his body in the morgue and no luck. The service was held at a local funeral home, attended by the detectives who were working the case, and they were also the ones who donated the money to make the funeral possible. The boy was buried in a potter's field, which is a public place of burial historically for paupers and criminals and unidentified people. On his gravestone, which was donated by a local business, was the simple inscription, Heavenly Father, bless this unknown boy, February 25th, 1957. A month or so after the burial, a man from Delaware contacted police, saying that just a few months before, his wife, two little girls and toddler son, John, had gone missing. The man said he'd gone to work one morning and upon his return, the house was empty. And he hadn't seen his family since, insisting that he'd had a happy marriage and had no idea why his wife would disappear with the kids. When he learned about the boy in the box, the man wondered whether it was his son, saying that John was a very thin child with a high metabolism and he struggled to retain any weight. His son would have been four years old at the time. From what I can find though, nothing ever came from this and I don't know if this man ever found his family or not. With no luck in finding the boy's identity, investigators decided to focus more on finding his killer instead, which is still a pretty impossible task, but they weren't having any luck either way. Their focus turned to a local family called the Martinez family, Joseph and Margaret Martinez, with their many, many children, all of whom appeared unkempt and skinny. When a neighbour one day saw their nine-year-old son Raymond rifling through the rubbish bin for food, they called the police who made a welfare visit. Sure enough, Raymond was found to be incredibly skinny and weak, along with seven other children found in the house. Strangely enough though, only three of those children appeared to be malnourished, the rest were fit and healthy. When Joseph was later questioned, he said that his wife Margaret had mental health issues and had just seemed to hate four of their children from birth. But where was the fourth child? The officer had only found three malnourished children in the house and they had nine children in total. When asked about a three-year-old daughter, Rose, Margaret said that she put her in the bin after she died because they couldn't afford a funeral. Margaret was said to be cold and unfeeling and she threw up alarm bells for the investigators who couldn't help but remember the story of the Good Samaritan of a woman who was not dissimilar in description to Margaret at the side of Susquehanna Road. If Margaret could literally admit to throwing the body of her three-year-old daughter in the bin, she very well could abandon the body of her son at the side of the road, probably showing him more dignity than she did Rose. And the majority of the Martinez children had been born at home, meaning there were no records of them with the hospital. The children very easily could disappear and nobody would have a clue. But how on earth were they supposed to prove anything in a time before DNA testing? Well, they couldn't, and nothing much ended up coming of this lead, but Margaret still had a missing child. And the same can be said for lead after lead in this case, they all just led nowhere. 
Now a lot of people have always thought this death was obviously a case of cold-hearted murder, but what if it wasn't that at all? Certain areas of Philadelphia never quite recovered after the Great Depression. A lot of families were still struggling hugely, some struggling so much they could barely afford to feed their children. And remember this was at a time before widespread birth control and sex education before you start the judgments. Could it be that the malnourishment in this case wasn't a sign of abuse necessarily, but just a reflection of his family's poverty? Maybe, but then what could be said about the bruising and the cause of death being blunt force trauma? Maybe the death was accidental, maybe the boy was beaten, but maybe it was just a case of manslaughter rather than cold-blooded murder. I don't think that makes it any better, but we're just kind of spitballing ideas here. But this was also a boy who was clearly receiving medical treatment in the form of surgical scars and the dye in his eye. Medical treatment was expensive. Nothing about this boy's situation quite made sense. Every aspect of it just juxtaposed the other. Perhaps he had been in a good situation until just a few weeks or maybe months prior to his death when things changed for him for whatever reason. A possible kidnapping or abduction could make sense here but the point still stands that no one ever reported a boy admitting that matched his description, not in the state or countrywide. The only thing that keeps going around my head is perhaps the boy did have some kind of chronic illness that maybe caused him to bruise easily, hence the bruises. Again, I'm just spitballing. I could talk about so many different theories in this episode, it would be never ending. So many different people have had suspicion cast upon them here for tiny reasons. So I am just going to focus on some of the main theories that have been thrown around over the years, the ones that seem most likely. But as we've seen in true crime cases being solved over the years, sometimes it is Occam's razor, the simplest answer is the correct one, and sometimes it's completely rogue. Whilst this case has technically closed or gone cold at some points in history, a lot of people have never given up. A man called Remington Bristow was an investigator at the medical examiner's office and he made it his personal mission to reunite the boy in the box with his identity and he took the case very personally due to the death of his own son as a child. From 1957 to into his retirement and up until his own death in 1993, Remington worked in this case practically full time, spending thousands of dollars of his own money chasing leads across the country. He carried the boy's death mask with him wherever he went, keeping it on his desk at work and in his briefcase when he wasn't to remind himself of his mission. Bristow's main theory was that the boy was the son of a woman called Anna Marie, who was the stepdaughter of a couple who ran a local foster home, and she was an unmarried woman. This theory came about in 1960, so three years after the boy had been found, when Bristow followed through on a psychic vision that the boy had come from a Philadelphia foster home that had been run out of an old mansion. Surely enough, upon looking into it, Bristow found that such a foster home did exist, only police had already spoken to them. Regardless, he interviewed the people running the home himself, and the next year when the old home was sold, he attended the estate sale. There he found a bassinet that very well could have been the one originally sold in the box. He told investigators of his theory, but they never really followed through on it any further. They'd already spoken to the couple after all. Bristow theorised until the day he died that Anna Marie had been unable to care for her son, hadn't been allowed to take him out in public to avoid the shame of being an unwed mother. When the son died, likely as a result of an accident, she was forced to abandon his body to avoid bringing any attention to her family. In 1998, the case of the boy in the box was officially reopened and the foster father, Arthur Nicoletti and Anna Marie were interviewed once again and the case against them was closed for good. Although from what I can see, it actually looks like by this point, Arthur had actually married his stepdaughter, Anna Marie, which is a whole world of icky in itself. Anna Marie admitted that she had indeed had a child out of wedlock who had died in the mid 50s and had been electrocuted in a tragic accident but the boy wasn't the boy in the box and morgue records did confirm her story. This same year, so 1998, the boy was actually exhumed and samples of his bone and teeth were taken for DNA analysis and they'd been hoping to test against Anna Marie's DNA but with the morgue records confirming what they did, there wasn't really any point. But that does mean that today we do have the boy's DNA information on file, mitochondrial DNA extracted from his tooth after several unsuccessful tries. So familial tracing is very possible in this case and I'm sure is currently underway. 
After the boy was exhumed, he was reburied in a proper cemetery at Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedarbrook, Philadelphia, who donated a large plot for him and he's cared for to this day by cemetery workers as well as the local public, who keep his grave decorated with flowers and toys. The coffin, headstone and funeral service were all donated by the son of the man who had originally buried him back in 1957, and the gravestone was engraved simply with America's unknown child. Hopefully not for too much longer. 1998 was actually a really big year for the boy in the box. In the early October, America's Most Wanted aired a segment about him in cooperation with the Philadelphia Police Department and the Vidoc Society, which is a crime solving club in Philadelphia, consisting of forensic professionals and motivated private citizens who donate their time and knowledge to the solving of unsolved cases, focusing on historic cases like this one. From what I can gather, the group mostly consists of retired detectives and investigators. The Boy in the Box case had very recently been reopened and police wanted to bring as many fresh eyes to the story as possible. And the Being on America's Most Wanted had the desired effect. Over 150 new tips came in. Most of the tips that came in were useless, but some did have promise. There were some names of children who had disappeared who resembled the Boy in the Box. There were some names of dodgy characters in and around the Philadelphia area. In almost all of these tips, the people were tracked down and nothing of interest was found. Nothing ended up being the tip that would solve the case, but by this point it was over 40 years on and any new tips were worth being followed through on. Detective Tom Augustine of the Philadelphia Police Department Homicide Division took over the case at this time and he's been in charge of it ever since, or at least as far as I was able to find online. I think he is still heading it. Another theory in this case is something often referred to as the Hungarian theory, which Bill Kelly started looking into after coming across a newspaper article about Hungarian refugees in the aftermath of the anti-Soviet revolution in 1956. He noticed that one of the young boys in the photograph accompanying this article looked a lot like the boy in the box. They had the same ears and the same face shape. However, the medical examiner had concluded that, from looks alone, the boy in the box had Northwest European ancestry, which is Scandinavia, the UK, West Germany. Hungary is East Europe. Also, the boy wasn't vaccinated, and any immigrants to the USA would surely have to be. Regardless, Kelly contacted the immigration services to see if they could help, and they could, but it wasn't exactly the answer that Kelly wanted. Years later, they found the boy in the photo, having been adopted by an American family in North Carolina. The boy was very happy and very much still alive. But still, people wonder if perhaps the boy in the box had been an immigrant or the child of an immigrant family, able to slip between the cracks of bureaucracy. It's nothing more than speculation, but that could make sense. One theory that a lot of people do think might have an actual basis in reality though is one that was first brought forward in 2002 by a woman identified as M or Martha, some sources even say Mary, we'll call her Martha. And Martha even provided a potential name for the boy, Jonathan. You can find Martha's whole testimony in the Boy in the Box book, but I will summarise it in this video. So the lead investigator on this case, Tom Augustine, received a phone call from a psychiatrist in Cincinnati, who said that one of her patients had called her in the early hours of the morning, demanding that she contact Philadelphia Homicide in regards to the Boy in the Box case. So Augustine and two retired investigators who are still working on the case headed straight to Cincinnati, where they met with Martha and her doctor. Martha told investigators that she was 13 years old in 1955 when Jonathan came into her life. She'd had a very hard childhood, her father was a high school teacher, her mother was a librarian, both held in high esteem by the community, but her home life was nothing but terror. She says she was molested by her father, which was allowed and even encouraged by her mother, who apparently had an interest in young boys herself. It seems like her parents had some sort of agreement between each other, which makes me sick to my stomach. When Mary was 13, her mother took her on a drive to somewhere else in Philadelphia, where she went into a house. She handed over an envelope of money and returned with a baby boy, Jonathan. The baby was kept in the basement of their house, in a room that used to be used for coal, and Martha wouldn't see much of Jonathan at first, but then eventually she would start sneaking down to the basement to spend time with him. She said that over the next couple of years, she never remembered Jonathan saying any proper words, he would just babble. And for two and a half years, that's how they lived, with Martha visiting him in the basement whenever she could. 
The parents never cut Jonathan's hair so it grew very long and they would bathe him just once a week. Then one day in 1957 when Martha was 15 years old, something happened. Her mother got mad with him for some reason, dragging him up for his bath and ordering Martha to cut his fingernails. The mother then tried to put him in the bath but it was way too hot and Jonathan kicked up a fuss, eventually throwing up the baked beans they'd had for dinner that evening. Now this is really important, if you recall me earlier saying about a brown sludge found in the esophagus of the boy, which was speculated to be vomit at the time. This very well could have been baked beans vomit. The police had never released this specific information to the public, so there's no way that Martha could have known this. The mother lost her temper after Jonathan vomited and started to beat him, losing it until he fell back and hit his head on the floor. She then started punching him and soon Jonathan died. The mother told Martha that Jonathan was going to be safe, she wrapped him in a blanket and took him out of the house to the boot of their car and Martha joined her on the journey to a quiet country road where a good Samaritan would come across them, Martha being ordered to hide the license plate of the car with her legs. Then the mother discarded of Jonathan's body in a box that was already at the side of the road. According to Augustine, this is the best lead they've ever had in this case, but it's not solid proof of anything. Martha apparently had a history of mental health problems and her psychiatrist claimed that she'd first heard the story in 1989, but waited until Martha was willing to come forward herself until she contacted the police. Frustratingly, there's no note of that original discussion from 13 years beforehand. It would be a completely different story if there was. But if Martha is lying or seeking attention, which sounds harsh but it very much does happen, she's now had 13 years to research as much as she can about the boy in the box. Her doctor has said that she always remained consistent with her story with no details added to her over the years, but you can't take a doctor at their word on this. Martha's story itself isn't confirmation of anything, it's just a really good lead to follow through on. However, in the 20 years since this, police have never been able to verify her story. Neighbours who had access to the house have denied a boy ever being there and there's nothing else to back Martha's story up. Regardless, many people do think the boy could have been this Jonathan, but even then, that's not much of an answer. That's not confirmation of his birth name. You don't know where he came from, why he was given up in the first place. There's still so many unanswered questions. Martha's story was an interesting one and there were so many details that made the story hard to dismiss but like I said, it's not proof. Her version of events though soon did go out to the media and became a bit of a sensation, bringing more eyes to the case of the boy in the box once again which is only ever a good thing. Other theories that have been floated around over the years is that the boy may have been raised as a girl due to the hasty haircut and long strands of hair found in the body as well as the fact that it appeared that his eyebrows might have been styled in a more feminine manner. In 2008, a forensic artist called Frank Bender released a sketch of the boy with this long hair, just in case that would spark a memory in someone. There's also a theory that he was the child of carnival workers, people who moved across the country constantly, but that theory was discarded by police. Chances are this was just a boy who was mistreated and had a horrible life. Perhaps his parents never wanted a child or they were just unable to care for one. Maybe he did have disabilities that made his parents resent him to the point of murder and they just threw his body away with the rubbish. Maybe he was a kidnapping victim whose missing persons report just got swept under the radar. Maybe his family were poor and unable to search for him. Maybe they never saw the coverage. Maybe they did, but they never connected the dots. There are so many maybes in cases like this and at this point we either need somebody to come forward who knows information who lived in Philadelphia at this time for which time is running out because people are getting older or we need genetic genealogy to come through for us and for him once again. I have no doubt it will but tracing children in these family trees is a lot harder than tracing adults. What if his mother was estranged from the family and no one knows what became of her? What if no one knows she had a child? There's a chance by this point she might have passed herself, so we might not ever be able to get full answers that way. But if there's anything true crime and DNA technology is teaching us at the moment, it's that even the most unsolvable of cases can be solved, so there's always hope. I was hoping there would be more recent advances in this case, but I couldn't find all that much online. You've just got to hope that people are working quietly behind the scenes. Apparently, a genealogist from the company Identifinders accidentally announced towards the end of 2021, so last year, that an announcement in this case isn't too far away, but it has been nearly a year now, it's September 2022. 
I've also seen people saying that rumour has it that the record of the oldest National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children case solved by genetic genealogy, which as it stands is the Bibb County John Doe from 1961, would soon be broken. The boy in the box predates Bibb County John Doe or Danny Armitrout as he was identified by four years. So if that record's about to be broken, it very well could be the boy in the box. I've seen people speculating on forums online for the last couple of years that he'll be identified by the end of the year, but that just doesn't seem to be happening. So let's all cross our fingers that 2022 is the year. But for now, let's try and spread the word and get that final boost of information out there. You never know, it could well be they already have his identity, but are still trying to trace family to get the full picture. But this is a murder investigation at the end of the day, and his identity doesn't form the whole story. There's a lot to unpack in this case, even if they do find his name. But you know what, that's the most simple of things, and that is the most important thing. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.